Well, thanks everyone for making it down. I think this is this is definitely our first combined user group between the Milwaukee and Chicago uh, uh, teams here. So awesome. Um, just a uh, little housekeeping. Do we know where the bathrooms are? I think they're out in the hallway. So okay, fairly self-explanatory. Obviously, go get a drink at the bar. Um, food over there. So hopefully, everyone took care of that already. Um, so today, I just want to, I, I guess. Um, thank our sponsors first and foremost. So we have uh, Paragon starting here. If you wanna, um, are we gonna do that right now? Or, or you wanna give a little spiel? <clears throat> you can have the big mic. I'll go, I'll go to the small mic. Hear me? Cool. So uh, I work for Paragon. Um, they're based in Cleveland, Ohio, but I'm one of the remote workers that are outside of Chicago. Um, so what, what do we do? We do everything. We basically partner up with other other um, Sitecore um, partners, you know, to help them with their project. If they need extra people or so on and so forth. Um, but we also do in-house projects too, like you know, a lot of other agencies. So we kind of do it all. We're kind of, that's our specialty. So, um, my last project, I worked with helping another client. You know, they had a with their client. So, and now we're doing. I'm working on an in-house project. So, do a little bit of everything. We're we just consider ourselves Psychor experts. So, that's about it. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. And then also American Eagle is sponsoring us tonight. So. Not only am I short, but I don't have the smooth voice Rick does. Um, my name is Art. I'm with uh, AmericanEagle.com. We're out of the Chicagoland area. We've been doing a lot of the uh, user groups since uh, Sitecore is lowercase s. Um, we work with uh, uh, Sitecore, of course, doing the, and we're a digital strategist, um, and we're pretty excited to be here. Thank you. All right. And then uh, I, I guess... Uh, our last sponsor here, Coveo. Um, Isabel, are you, uh, sure. you want to jump up? Yeah. And then also our first presentation, obviously. Yeah, getting ready for that one. All right, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'll, yeah, I'll break the ice here. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you for, for the invitation. So may, many of you, maybe you've heard of Coveo, referred us as Search, but we would like to say that Search is the beginning of the journey. And everything mm -hmm. that you'll get to see today is related to relevance. So uh, having a website and no visitor finding what they're looking for, this is where we can help with any site for implementation. So yeah, the stage is yours. We see the, the site for user group. Uh... Yeah, sure. that's great, perfect. So let's start right away. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen my demo at Sitecore Symposium. Uh, Isabella, I have a little loop. Go to you. So there we go. Uh, basically, what we've done here is we're, we are using the Sitecore uh, demo called Abat to show all the new Google uh, features. So I will walk through a demo to expose the different Google for Sitecore features as well as the platform. Also, you will be able to see uh, the integration between Sitecore and Covil. So if you have any questions during the presentation, just feel free to uh, raise your hand or, I don't know, do a sign. I can see you in my screen, so it should be good. And then let's just get started. So uh, what is Covil? Actually, it's the cloud platform that we integrate in Sitecore to make sure that you're able to index all the content and that people are able to find it afterwards. So in this uh, Abita Electronic demo, the first thing we've done here at the top of every web page, actually, we uh, created that huge search box that will be used to uh, navigate through the site and also to find some items. So the real machine learning journey starts right away here when you type something in that search box. 
So we are providing some very suggestions here at the bottom. So you see we have some uh, values that we are taking from the items, such as the department or any other field that you have in Sitecore. But we also are providing some uh, machine learning query suggestion, and that's the cool thing out of COVID. So, tree. I don't have any item called cook food faster. It's just people are going on my website, and that's their own words. They're using their words to find my items. So there is a mismatch between my item title and the way they think it's called. So Kaveo actually learns from what people is typing. They uh, We look at people making some items with this word, and if they have success uh, while searching and using those words, I must be suggestion that we need to render those interface. You can also use those um, templates uh, options that we had before, but now we are able to switch between different layouts option, which is a cool feature, I think. And I also, with the same underscore templating engine, I build those quick views as well. So you're able to provide really in-depth experience uh, in the commerce just to make sure that people stay on that page as uh, long as possible. Uh, we also provide sorting options. That's that's pretty usual stuff from the component. It's just since I have now a demo with a lot of product, I can use it for sorting by price or by rating or whatever uh, the other field that I could leverage in Sitecore directly. So let's try to personalize that thing a little bit since it's okay to see those results, but I want it to be personalized. So I will have a look here at my profile. Uh, same thing as earlier, I'm not tagged yet. I didn't click on any page. So let's try something really generic such as power. I am in an electronic shop, so there's a lot of stuff working on power, obviously. You can see that Coveo is stemming for power as well as power. Then it's really uh, a lot of stuff, so phone chargers, some speakers, some uh, car charger. So let's just get personalized. I will search for a game, a game station, and then I will click on that. So when you go on a page, and it's the standard Psychor experience. I mean, I'm, I'm going on a page, the content author have assigned some keys and value to the content here. So if I open that panel again, you will see that I have a persona right now, which is Gareth the Team Gamer. I don't know if you guys are playing any video games, but I do. So when I go on a website like that, I usually end up looking for my new PlayStation games and release. So then if I had the same query again, let's say power, you'll see now that the search results will be influenced by my persona. So I have now articles from the gaming sections, and that's for uh, the, like the five or ten first results before going to something more generic. But Kobe was able to understand that people like me who look for power with that persona are usually clicking on those results instead of a speaker or a phone charger. So Kaveo is able to personalize that experience and understand that a gamer will probably look to charge this controller and not a cell phone in that context. The third usage that we do uh, for machine learning that's really cool is the uh, product recommendation. So it's the uh, third use case that is pretty different, but really interesting. So you see here, when I go on a product page, we install that recommendation component. So since I look for Blender and after video games and power, my recommendations are a little weird because I am a little weird in my behavior. So we will understand that. But if you have a straight behavior, let's say you're looking just for fridge or uh, for, for oven, you will have recommendations based on your, on your behavior and other users like you. Uh, what's really cool here is that we are using the same templating engine, so I build a little HTML snippet to display my results. And I also here have uh, an example of Sitecore, Sitecore straight related product. But to do so, you 
uh, enter manually the relation between your product. So you need to pay somebody actually to build a list of related products and, and recommendations. So instead, you can use that kind of plugin here just to automate that whole process and make recommendation way more relevant because they're based on people like me or like you. So that's about it for the front end part of that little demonstration. We saw the query suggestion, which is pretty powerful, with the uh, department also that you can use, which is a fast control. So if I click on appliance, it will just filter down here my department. And then I have my templating options, my machine learning query suggestion, and my machine learning ranking optimization. So it looks all magical, but there's something behind for sure. We are leveraging the Google platform. So let me just show you that. Uh, I don't know if many of you have used our new Covil for Sitecore platform, but actually it's the Covil platform. So for every line of business that we have, we now have Covil for Dynamics, Covil for Salesforce, and also for Sitecore. So for every line of business, we are leveraging the same platform behind. So we make sure that all those cool features are available for every integration that we do. In the Sitecore world, how that translates is, you see here when I install Covil in my machine, it will create two source in my Covil cloud, one for each database in Sitecore. So this is where my index items are. So you see I have my content tree in a sort of, all my items are now packed in the Covil platform. And that's what I'm querying when I'm using this search interface here. So whenever you're typing, you're hitting that platform. Uh, this platform is pretty cool. Uh, you have access to all the old school, old prem uh, technology that we had before with uh, Covil Enterprise Search Module. It's just that you don't need to install it. You just you just use it as a service. It's way more easier for an, an implementer or a partner because you don't need to worry about scaling mirrors, the search API, all those components that we had before. They're not. They're all gone. So every query that you do from a search interface will go inside a query pipeline, as we call. Those query pipeline will apply a machine learning model. So that's where you tune your relevance and you suggest queries. So those machine learning models are activated by default for any implementation. So basically, if you start using it today, you will see those models in your organization. It's really easy to tune, uh, really simple stuff, so it's about one click to, to, to set it up. We're working right now on some advanced options for our users, but right now it's working uh, top-notch, just the way it is. So you, you set your update frequency, how many times you want the machine to learn from, from and then the impact on, on your relevancy. So if you want to have a really good boost or a small boost on the items, uh, those are cool stuff. It's the automation of all our implementation. Then you can work that by end also. So you see here, I have some example of a query that I expanded myself. So when I was looking for coffee, I didn't found the espresso machine. So with a simple thesaurus entry, I'm expanding my, my keyword with another one. So if I'm looking now for coffee, You'll see that in my search interface, I will have some espresso, uh, espresso, just let me correct that. Oh gosh, my internet is so slow now. I'll just restart it. As usual, huh? So basically, you enter those keywords, and it will be expand them in the uh, in the search interface. You can also change your ranking, and uh, a lot of options from the from the relevance to fine tune your search engine. You know, and then the beautiful part of using Veo and those components is that when you go on a web page with Veo. We are tracking down behavior, and that's how we do machine learning, but that's also how we do reporting. 
So uh, by looking at those reports, you will be able to see here usage behind uh, your search interface. And that's where you find really interesting stuff. So basically, it's an analytic dashboard. You can customize it the way you want. But here you can see what's going on on your web page, on your search interface of the of your web page. So basically, you see that I have a lot of queries. I have few clicks. I can see from where those queries are coming from. And then what are the top products that people are looking for? So it's really, really good piece of technology here. And since in my demo, I'm using the Sitecore persona, I'm able here to track them down. And if I click on one of those persona, it will be added as a filter to the whole dashboard. So you see here now, I will be look, uh, looking at some information only for people like Garrett, the team gamer, which is pretty cool because you can, right now I have my persona, so the hard work is done. But before, when I didn't have any persona, you can look at the behavior of, uh, you can try to find some group of queries, some date or some cities that have special behavior and try to track down people to then put those personas back in Sitecore. So it can be really a nice tool to help you uh, understand what kind of people are going on your search page. I don't know if my, my page is, is back there. So you see here, I wrote coffee in my search box, but then uh, espresso is also I like. So you can extend your query like that in some really fun use cases. When you look at your uh, product performance, you will be able to see that some documents are not reachable. Sometimes people are looking for some keywords and they're not able to find at all in content. Or otherwise, they are able to find content, but the, the document is really low in the list. So with uh, those kind of dashboard, you can have a look at your click count, at your, uh, at your modifier, if you are uh, afflicted by machine learning. And then if you find something that have really a low relevancy, you can just go back in your query pipeline and add some information in the thesaurus. So in my example, uh, let's say I'm looking for a N64, so I'm pretty old school in my gaming choice. So I can just extend that query with a uh, game console here. And then if I go back to my search interface and I start looking for N64, I will be able to find some result from Game Console, but without it, I'm sure that there is no Nintendo 64 in that Sitecore demo. <laughs> so um, that's the main feature of the Creo Cloud platform. And uh, you saw also the front end of my implementation in retail.cavio.com. Let's now go in Sitecore to see the mix between those two, so the, the full integration. So here I am. I will be logged out probably. Let's go back in. So when you install Kaveo for Sitecore, first of all, now, uh, as I said before, the installation process is really simple. You don't need to install all those on-prem components. The only thing you need to do is install a package in your Sitecore instances. And that's it. First of all, it will install all the Kaveo stuff. So you can see here that we have a lot of stuff um, in the control panels, some diagnostic pages, some configuration tools, and then you install Kaveo for Sitecore, you start your index process, push the content in the cloud, and you're done. Basically, after you need to build your interface, I know it sounds easy, it's not that easy, otherwise I wouldn't have a job. Uh, it's way easier than it was before, I can guarantee that. So let's go in the content tree to have a little look at how uh, Kaveo, uh, how do you build actually a search page like the one you saw? So this is the new Kaveo Hive framework. We split all the Kaveo components in really small parts 
to make sure that it's more flexible than before, that you're not stuck with a facet column and a result column. You can now really do whatever you want with the product, which was a request from the developers that are using the product. So first of all, in um, Covigo Hive, we now use data sources as the main provider for information of those components. So if you go here, you see that I have a, a bunch of little Covigo components, and those are used as a data source for my component. So if I open, uh, let's see, here a search interface, you see that for all the components that we can use in the screen, you now have access to a lot of functionality that you can use directly here. So without having to code and to modify the JavaScript file, you can directly use uh, those settings to enable automatic boosting, to use your persona, to change your query pipelines. You have a lot of uh, options. One of the cool options is the query rankings. If you click here, you'll see that directly in Sitecore, you can change the ranking of your items uh, based on rules that are, that are re human readable, actually. So that's pretty cool. Let's see here. I want to use rating um, as a field. It will just fetch all the fields, so I have a little delay here. But then you choose your field, and then you can compare to a value. Uh, let's say I want to boost my items having a rating greater than four. I want to boost them and put them at the top of the list. I'll just come back here in a few seconds since it's loading pretty badly. Uh, this is the other view that I want to show you. It's basically the uh, experience editor in Sitecore. So with uh, Covino for Sitecore, as before, we are fully integrated in, the, in this interface. The only thing that's pretty cool is now we have access to all those placeholders and columns that you didn't have before. So you will be able to add some tabs and some facets and some Covino component but you won't be stuck in those columns. Is it done here? Is it loading? So yeah, we, we broke apart the layout that we had before just to make it way more flexible. So now you will be able to put some component whenever you want in the interface. So it's way more easier than before to add that global search box and those search pages. Everything is more flexible than before. So I don't know if you use it yet, but I think we'll have a lot of fun using it. Um, and that's about it for my front end uh, demo. So uh, do you have any questions on what you saw or you want me to uh, talk about something more specific? Oh, there I am. I'll just go back to the way it was. Yeah, there it is. So you want me to go deeper in the uh, Sitecore backend, or I can just show you some live example of the product. I'm pretty flexible on the yeah. on you know what? Show on the what you guys want yeah. to see, actually. Show the personalization portion. I'm going to close the cameras because they saw you now, but to make the, the screen bigger. If you don't mind closing your camera, please. Oh. Yeah, could you close your camera? Vince. Oh, no. <laughs> Hello? Uh, there you go. Perfect. Thank you. Can you hear us? Can you hear us, Vince? Are you going to do this type of presentation when Phil Phil will be in Mars? <laughs> That'll be crazy. <laughs>
sure. Can you still hear me and see my screen? Yes, both. I don't know what happened. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, for personalization, you have a lot of options to do so. So basically, what I've done in that demo. I can hear you now. Oh. Okay. Yeah, it's... Can you hear in the back? Okay. Yep. Perfect. Uh, it's working fine now. Okay. So, um, yeah. basically, uh, here what I've done is I enable in this demo the automatic boosting function, which works with Persona. So, in Coveo, you're not required to use XDB and Persona to personalize your experience. So, it can be done without it. Sure, results are better when you use it. So basically, when you enable that automatic boosting uh, functionality here, is that we are indexing those keys that you use to tag content in your website. So if you have done so, we're able to match the pattern of the visitor that is coming. We know that it's a gamer in my example. And the item in my index have those keys, so I'm able to match uh, from what I know from that persona. He likes video games, he likes console. I can boost those items based on the persona. So that's one first way to do it, but it requires, however, you need to have the, the Psychorix DB and all that stuff enabled. So if you want to do it without uh, Psychor stuff, Basically, you just need to uh, switch on here that machine learning tuning relevance and how that stuff's working. It's pretty simple, actually. When somebody goes on your web page and look for, I don't know, something like cell phone. So we are tracking down behavior uh, for every user. And then when people are looking for a cell phone and they're scrolling down and now they're clicking on the third link, let's say, this behavior, if repeated, if everybody who goes on my web page are always clicking on that result after clicking, uh, after uh, entering cell phone as a query, Kveo will be able to understand that this keyword should be associated with that result. So when somebody is entering cell phone, we will boost we will may will push a little push on the item that were lower before, but then are way more relevant to that context. So all that uh, relevancy tuning is fully automated. You don't need to do uh, nothing, and it's working without XDB. If you have XDB, however, it will uh, provide some ranking uh, based on your persona, so it will be stronger. You will have a way more personalized experience. So I know that when somebody's an anonymous visitor is looking for cell phone, he's always clicking on this result. But then when I'm a gamer and I'm looking for cell phone, I'm clicking on this result. So Kveo is able to uh, split those algorithms based on the context that you're providing. So you can push as a context some countries, some cities, some persona. Or even if that in this demo we are pushing the uh, card item. So do you have something in your card or not? And that's for us something really important because when I click on, let's go and see uh, a front loading machine and go inside this. So when I click on a result, based on what I've done before, uh, I, I showed you a little bit earlier those product recommendation. But then if I have already one uh, front loading machine in my card, I probably don't want to see it again here. So when people are looking for TVs, they want to have other TVs as recommendation. They want to see the best TV in the class, you know? But then when you have bought your TV, you're uh, about to buy it and it's in your card, you don't want to see TVs anymore. You want to see accessories. You want to see what people will buy after they buy the TV. So those kind of experience are really easy to do with Coveo. So you just need to pass uh, a, simple, a simple context key in your, in your queries. And to do so, I use the Sitecore personalization uh, mechanism. So Actually, there's a rule in this demo built by Sitecore 
to know how many items is in your card. So based on that rule, I change my component to, uh, to, to insert that value inside it. So that's one first way to do. And then here at the top for personalization and for a fully immersive experience, you can use your context as well in the product recommendation. So right now it's generic when I'm looking for P, I'm looking for puzzle, power, price, whatever. But then Kveo is can be aware of my persona at this moment and then provide some suggestions based on my persona, which is a really cool feature that we have embedded in uh, Adobe Photoshop, actually. So when you're log with your user, you're passing that information with uh, the query, and we are able to bucket you in one of uh, one of many, many buckets to uh, have way more relevant item. So when you're looking for crop a picture, I know that you already did it because your user ID tell me that your previous queries and then we're able to match you with people like you. So this can be done uh, as a standalone Kveo product, but then when you match it with Sitecore XDB, it, it, it gets really, really strong. So that was my uh, pitch for this. Do you have any other questions or something I can, uh, I can help you with? Doing regarding uh, GDPR Can you hear coming me? up on May 2018. Can you hear? I hear, but not really loud. Can you repeat the question near near the microphone? Just repeat it so I think you can see. As long as you're close to the Yeah, say it again. Can you? What is Kaveo no, doing in regards to GDPR? What is, uh, I don't get the question. Can you just explain it further? <laughs> Sorry for that. Yeah, in, on May 2018, the uh, European Union is enforcing a uh, new set of laws regarding data protection. What is Kavio doing to prepare for that? So, right, right, it's an excellent question, actually, and we, we have a lot of concerns uh, about our, uh, our clients are always asking what's going on with data residency and what we do with our information. So, basically, right now, all the Kaveo Cloud is on Amazon. Uh, that's where we build the platform. And we don't, uh, we don't want to move away. Uh, we have a really strict way of managing the data. We're HIPAA compliant as well as many other uh, security uh, provider uh, and certification. But basically what we're working on is uh, a new technology stack that will help us uh, bring the data elsewhere without uh, change in the whole package. So you will be able to hold your index, whatever you want. You will be able to store your data in your own data center or in your own walls if you want, and then still be able to use Coveo. So we are looking at, um, how can I say it, just the index part of the whole stack. We're looking at making it as a standalone product, if I can express it that way. So you will be able to stack Coveo on top of an index that is not within our walls. So that's the way we approach uh, that situation. Does that answer your question? All right. Vincent, uh, Coveo has pretty extensive security cert certifications, correct? That is correct. Uh, in the Covio for Sitecore world right now, the way we do in, inside Sitecore, actually, we're leveraging the Sitecore security model just to make sure that people, if you have some uh, closed page that require a login, you won't be able to see those results. 
from an index perspective, uh, we are working closely with a lot of compliance and certification to make sure that all the information that is in, in Coveo is up to the highest standards. So that's why we now have a HIPAA compliant platform that we will be leveraging in all of our healthcare implementation. Uh, and when I talk about healthcare, it's less in Sitecore world because usually in Sitecore it's public information, front-facing website. But then when you are indexing CRM information such as in Salesforce or any do uh, documents that are uh, related to the healthcare folder of any patients, you need that really high level of, uh, of security. And that's what we are working on. Uh, actually, it's already been worked on. It's live. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, thank you. Thank you really much, guys. Uh, next time I'll be there in person. Usually I travel with uh, Isabel, but then I'm stuck here in the north in Quebec City. So uh, have a great night, guys, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. AmericanEagle.com is a full-service digital agency specializing in web development, hosting, and digital services. AmericanEagle.com has the experience and resources to handle your site core project of any size and scope. Whether you start with us brand new to Sitecore, building your very first implementation, or whether you're already on Sitecore, we can come in at any stage of your development and help you be successful with your next step on your digital roadmap. Since every Sitecore implementation is going to be very different based on the customer's needs, we need to come up with a very customized training plan for our clients. AmericanEagle.com Sitecore team has achieved platinum status with Sitecore. Only a select handful of companies throughout the world have achieved this. Our team has over 100 certifications in Sitecore in multiple areas. We have four MVPs, three technical and one digital strategist. We have also completed over 250 projects on the Sitecore platform itself. AmericanEagle.com understands the importance and complexities of Sitecore hosting. We host over 150 Sitecore websites and offer over 1,200 hours of monthly Sitecore support. Recently, Samaritan Health's Web Properties won Best Site Design for eHealthcare's Leadership Award. Samaritan Health's Web Properties are a great testament for how robust of a platform Sitecore can be for clients, tying in multiple analytical data points, tying in robust functionality such as find a location, find a doctor. We now can empower businesses to use real-time data to personalize experiences on the website for each individual user. Our work with BCU, Baxter Credit Union, earned them the 2014 Sitecore Site of the Year Award. Some of the highlights of that project included the multiple integration points that we helped them with. We co-developed the project working with BCU's development team as well as their marketing and project management team. Kamatsu America came to American Eagle with the distinct challenge of helping cut down their content management efforts. One of the main conversions on the Kamatsu America site is simply driving users to the product catalog looking for product information and eventually driving them through the request of quote form. Utilizing Sitecore's A-B testing, their markers can now test different variations of their product detail page. The great thing about AmericanEagle.com's Sitecore team is they have more experience than just about anyone in the industry. A lot of our employees have been with us well over 10 years, and we can take our knowledge from any type of project we do and apply it to the Sitecore projects as well. As a Sitecore Certified Platinum Partner, we can handle your project of any size and scope. Reach out to start a discussion about your needs. Your customers are more mobile, more social, and more demanding than ever. In this expectation economy, you need to deliver the most relevant information to every person that interacts with you through your website, your mobile presence, or your apps. My name is Dan Cruikshank. I'm the president of Fishtank Consulting, and we're a Caveo certified system integrator of online experience. So within Embridge.com, we've actually positioned Caveo as more of a relevancy engine. We have the content seamless, so if it comes from Sitecore, it comes from Caveo, it's actually indistinguishable. And that allows us to use Caveo to deliver the right content at the right time based on personas, based on location. We can actually take in the information about the user and reflect that in an automated fashion back to the user. So we've really eliminated the need for the content authors to target. We're actually having Caveo do the heavy lifting to target to the 
customers. Coveo takes the heavy lifting out of web content personalization using intelligent search, predictive analytics, and machine learning. Coveo analyzes search traffic and web stream journeys through your site to learn what content is actually most relevant to your visitors, then suggests and recommends the most relevant content automatically based on what has worked to constantly deliver the most relevant content to each and every visitor. So find out more about how Coveo can help you deliver more personalized online and mobile experiences today. All right. Yeah. 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 Well, let's go. Let's do this. Mark, you, you're. Uh... I'll be your moderator this evening. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I'm Mark Survey. I work for Pitficient. I'm a Sitecore MVP. I will not be answering questions this evening, so you may all now applaud. <laughs> <clears throat> you guys don't know how lucky you are. All right. So let's introduce the panel we have up here. On the very end, with the lighting, we have uh, John Price from American Eagle. He is the Sitecore Site Practice Director. I know how to say Sitecore, just not spell it like on the front door, so. <laughs> Thank you, John. We have Tim. You know I'm gonna do this, right? We got Tim and Alias from American Eagle. Director of Digital, and he is a strategy MVP, Sitecore. You guys can clap at any time for these guys. <laughs> we have with us, next to him, Travis Jensen, Laughlin Constable. He is the Software Development Team Lead. Oh, Travis. I can, I can do this in more words if you guys want more words. <laughs> no, that's fine. All right, Ahmed Akor. From American Eagle, senior or senior site core architect. And next to him is partner in crime from American Eagle, James Gregory, also a senior site core architect. Pay no attention to the lights. <laughs> then, without further ado, we have with us Kelly Brennan from Layer One the goddess of commerce. <laughs> I have that written down. She is a commerce MVP. And then none other, and I gotta keep flipping it around because everybody said out of, out of order. Renee Gusman, Laughlin Constable, who is the VP of digital. Next to him, we have Sitecore runner, Rob Riley from Paragon. He is the senior web developer. I almost got that wrong, man. Sorry. <laughs> if you could read my writing, it would be great, because I can't. Last but not least, he is at the very last of the list. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Joe Wiemet from Geek Hive, and he is a technical lead. All right, guys, so everybody here has been to Symposium, I hope. Otherwise, this is going to be a really weird panel. <laughs> so for each of you guys, and, and, and chime in, grab a mic, um, not all at once, what's the single most important thing that you guys walked away with this year from Symposium? The single I, most important thing. What I took from it was uh, cloud first. Everything's cloud first. You take a look at uh, Sitecore 9 downloaded, it, it's cloud first. Containers are next, I guess but cloud first. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, how we always say they only use 10% of our brain as humans, we're probably only using about 10% of what Sitecore offers. Um, we're not really pushing it as far as, and there's just a lot of stuff out there that um, it's so cool that we just haven't even tapped into yet. Um, and we live this every day, so it's kind of exciting that there's so much out there that, you know, that we haven't done. You know, one of the one of the things too we found out too is a uh, web form for marketers will be going yeah, away. Grab a microphone. Oh. No, you're fine. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you got it. Yeah, right. yeah. So web form for marketers will be going away at um, at Sitecore 9.1. They're going to replace it with their own version, and also Lucene as well is going to be going away with uh, Solar and Azure kind of taking over. So they're kind of moving forward. They're, it's kind of like they see what people are using and they're kind of integrating that more. So. 
um, yeah, I guess from a commerce perspective as well, we all knew it was coming, um, but commerce server will be disappearing. Um, if anybody's ever played around with it, it's been a, a thorn in people's side for a while now, um, and dealing with a legacy system from you know the mid two thousand early to mid 2000s so yeah that's all disappearing and it's you know kind of all .NET Core OData services and things like that so um, we're getting to be a really modern kind of um, commerce platform there as well which is cool <laughs> don't spend a week in Vegas yeah. That was my <laughs> uh, and then from the experience marketing SBOS side, uh, definitely the in exciting new marketing automation platform that's coming uh, with Nine uh, is well, well deserved. Uh, but uh, mainly is that there's a lot of extensibility coming through XConnect, and I think that's very exciting for inbound and outbound data finally without multiple different ways that sometimes and sometimes don't work. Also, like from uh, from development uh, perspective, the new sidecar configuration uh, role engine. So basically, it's going to cut down a lot of the deployments, uh, setting up a new sidecar instance for your different kind of uh, server roles, so your content delivery, your content management. So that really helps us, helps us also in the upgrade for sidecar. And also the sidecar migration tool, it's getting, uh, we have a new version for it now. So you can jump directly from Sidecar 6, 6 to 9 in one uh, upgrade process. Maybe the biggest thing then is that, you know, Sidecore's actually listening, it yeah. seems, which is something different if you've worked with Sidecore for a while. I keep banging the table, I apologize. Um, and they're actually doing stuff about it. It's progressing as a system and we're moving forward and we're getting all of these new capabilities that are actually, you know, as developers, what we want and what we need. Um, and as markers, what you want and what you need. So that's really exciting to be working and invested in a platform that's actually moving forward for us. Yeah, I wanted to second that point because that's what I took out of it is both from the marketing and developer side, all of our wish lists, those who have been working for years and I wish we'd had, you know, wish could be easier for front end guys. I, we hate web forms. We wish, you know, we can get data into XDB. All those things we wished for, that we got. It was, like, it was like Christmas coming early. <laughs> yeah, to that to that point, there is you know there's some huge things like Cortex, which our agency is starting to push machine learning a lot. Um, they didn't really tell us a ton about what it is, other than some really cool marketing stuff to get our appetites wet. But it's huge machine learning, and it's going to be. I mean, just from what what they showed us, it's going to be awesome. And that's kind of a big thing. And then on the other side of it, it's little things like um, any developer who's ever worked in Sitecore has that you've tried to use component-based development, which you should be, um, you, you come into the problem where you have dynamic placeholders and you, how, do you, how do you put multiple components on a page in different placeholders? Dynamic placeholders are built into the system now, which is cool. Um, we're using one of Nick Wesselman's uh, modules that he wrote to, to kind of overcome this. We can get rid of that. It's coming right out of the package now, right out of the box. So they're listening top to bottom, small things to big things, which I thought was pretty cool. You didn't use Mark Survey's module to do that? <laughs> I don't know why you would either. I would say, you know, echoing what everyone's saying here, one thing that Sitecore has historically not been weak at, but could use improvement at, is scalability and time to market. So Azure Paz being able to deploy using slot deployments, Coveo going cloud, just the time to market and the time to deploy is going to exponentially get much better as we go into time here. So. That's actually probably the most I've ever heard from a panel just kind of rattle things off. So obviously there's a lot there. Um, I do want to touch on Cortex a little bit. And the lights uh, agree with me. Thanks for, for, thanks for that mic adjust. Yeah, you know, they've been following me. Um, so we don't know much about it, right? They're, they're sales speak in, in pretty much. But what do you think, what would you predict that we have forward or look, what do we, <laughs> What do you think we have um, to look forward to with Cortex? I mean, what changes do you predict that would be coming? I mean, you know, uh, machine learning is the hot topic right now. And um, sometimes it borders on, wow, that's really creepy. And their, their marketing presentation didn't, uh, didn't disappoint in that realm where they had... Uh, <laughs> they, 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 Vicky. Vicky, yeah, they had this girl oh, who yeah. would... Um, she was ready to buy some stereo equipment and they somehow more or less cortex into her 
records and found that she had bought a house in the area. And based on that, she was ready to um, to buy this stereo. And it was like, through the whole thing, it all boiled down to she got like a 10% discount and bought $4,000 worth of stereo equipment in one click, you know. So it's a little crazy, but in pie in the sky. But I think machine learning is becoming that thing that is a realistic thing for not just IBM to be doing, but now we can start doing it for, we have a hospital site. We can start saying, well, does this patient look for doctors downtown versus at home? And you know, can we get her an appointment closer to where she's at? It's all this cool stuff that, um, you know, we at least expect it to be, you know, machine learning integrated directly into Sitecore. Um, and I think it's going to be really cool. Unfortunately, that's all we have is, you know, I think or we expect or we hope. But I think it's going to deliver. I mean, they were pretty proud of it. They spent a good deal on the keynote um, talking about it. They had this whole big thing with Vicky and the, the scenario. So um, I think it's going to be cool. Um, it's probably going to grow in infancy. It's in its infant state right now, but it should grow and become something that I think everybody tries to get into their, their solutions. There's something fascinating you said there that I was wondered about when I was seeing that same thing. You're talking about HIPAA, you know, medical yep. industry, yep. Cortex. I feel like those are two opposing forces that they're going to have to well, address very well with security. And so is XDB, and so is all these things where you're right. gathering information about a person, but they started to talk about how they're looking at that as a big deal, and they're going to start, you know, allowing to be able to obfuscate your data and encrypt it and do all this stuff so that, you know, your clients and your people who are using the site and whose data you're protecting can feel comfortable that um, the data is protected. And it's really just used to give a better personalized experience, not to mine your data and to, well, to mine your data, but not to do it in a malicious way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and with that, too, is there's still a lot of opportunity to use data that's not secure you know, yeah. considered a security issue, mm -hmm. or the PII aspect of the GDPR to the question earlier with the Caveo side. Uh, there's a lot that you can still do from just implicit activity of a user and what we can store, whether in the cookie or whatever they bring in the future. I would say for myself with Cortex as a marketer, uh, from that perspective, there's a lot of opportunity that you start to let marketers actually do their job and less of a configuration of the system that they utilize. And that's where I think Cortex really has a promise of what they started to show. Uh, again, while pie in the sky, it's something that a lot of uh, machine learning promise is bringing, where auto segmentation is happening without you having to go in and build all the rules for it. It tells you, here's all the common rules that are happening. I think that's one of the most exciting things about Cortex is it's going to free the marketer up, and they talked about this in the presentation. It's gonna free the marketer up to actually do their marketing job and less of a configuration job. They did share a little bit more detail in one of the developer sessions where they gave an example of Vicky. Um, and uh, they, they posed this question to Cortex of, based on you know from the XDB data, what's the likelihood of this contact buying a bike within the next seven days, yeah. a mountain bike? And so that's kind of, I think, the initial framework to work with is you pose a question and it'll give you a probability as a result. And then you can use that probability to say, okay, on my homepage, if this contact is likely to buy this product within seven days, I'm gonna treat that and I'm gonna show it on the home page. So that's kind of coming into the rule editor for personalization and getting a probability score back from Cortex for what you ask it to digest. And I think there's applications for it outside of the, the pers just pure personalization of personas as well. And you know, helping content editors actually create better content, um, helping people tag you know, media items and content to kind of bring that in, suggesting how they should title content and, you know, finding ways to target relevant audiences as well. So I think, you know, it's not just about providing a personalized experience, but also just helping people do their everyday jobs um, in a simpler way as well. That's a great point. Um, another thing they showcased is the headless capability of psych work where you have a source of truth for your data and it's structured so you're able to serve it multi-channel uh, and you're able to collect uh, information for xdb from any channel because of xconnect the ability to have one source of truth for your content allows your marketers to be able to use that data in not just your desktop site uh, its mobile version but apps uh, kiosks, uh, smartwatches, IoT, you name it. 
it's there. Let's let's talk about the Sitecore um, JavaScript services for a bit. So that's one thing that everybody was really kind of the ooh and ah of, of Symposium, at least from my standpoint. So as the partner network, as developers, what are we going to have to look at now of changing our paradigms for delivery? I threw a hard one in there for you, Tim. Thanks, thanks, Mark. They talked we, a <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I, I was going to say, we're not going to shift anytime soon, but I think it is coming based on what they actually develop with it. And I think it's promising from more of the microsite landing page, I need to stand up something quick perspective uh, versus it's a true full solution right. replacement. I think it's a, it's an, it's like a, I want to call it like a baby brother, but it's like a, <laughs> It's like a little add-on that you get that's a benefit. It's going to aid in certain circumstances, yeah. but at other times you're going to be kind of like, don't try to you do everything with it. Well, because if you do take it and try and do a full front end with it, why do you have Sitecore, right? Yep. I mean, I think the back end and the front end really mesh well together. This kind of thing, they, they said that one of the nice things with this, you could use progressive web apps to um, consume some of these services. Now, progressive web apps are very infant, and they don't work great in every browser, but they are something that, like you said, probably works great for a, a site like that that basically makes it feel mobile. It's your, your landing page. It's your kind of your online persona, but it's not a full-fledged system that, you know, and you could do that, but, I mean, I guess it just all depends on your needs, but it's basically, it allows you to do a headless kind of install with your site core data and then consume it however you want. It's, it's another buzzword, Mark, that is out there, kind of like machine learning was three years ahead of its actual time. Yeah. Headless is another one of those that you've seen creeping up over the past couple, you know, year and a half or so. Of, we want headless. We want no dependency on a platform. Well, you still have a platform behind right. it. Yeah. So you still have a platform, but, you know. But I think a large part of that is and we've all been into uh, case trying to hire Sitecore developers. Who's got .NET? Who's got Sitecore developers? And then how do we get front-end developers to work with them? And how does it all work together? And front-end and back-end fighting. But when everything could be a front-end developer, you don't need to know .NET. You, you can be a front-end guy and do everything the us.net guys can do. That opens up the whole Sitecore development, and it opens up so many opportunities for how are we going to develop these applications. You know, so that I think, I really think it's not, in the future, it's not going to be segmented. I think that's going to be our future. Is that we aren't going to, it's not going to be a .net world anymore. It's going to be totally headless, and that opens it up to so many more people and so many more opportunities. It's another tool in the toolbox, really. Yeah. You can use it for however you want, and if your shop decides that it's something you can utilize, I think it's a great tool. I don't mean to knock it, like, and I, I don't no, think yeah. it's just, it's one of those things where use it how you need it, and if you have a real need for it, it's very cool they have that layer built in that you can consume it without having a front end tied to the, the platform. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely a tool in, in the toolbox, and I think it is, it's not going to fade away or anything like that, but I think that's the, again, the misconception of, AI and machine learning, everyone walks out of a, a, a presentation like the Cortex one saying, oh my gosh, I need that, but is it a need right now? Are you ready and prepared for it? I completely agree. Front-end development versus .NET developer has been a struggle of implementing Sitecore in the past, and I like that from that approach, but when you take and have a uh, business decision maker who doesn't understand either side of it, and they hear headless, you don't have mm -hmm. to have the platform aspect, you can just hire a front-end developer versus a you know, specific .NET developer, there's still a need for both. I think it is faster for certain things, and it makes the life of the front-end developer uh, extremely better from what they're able to you know, have from a flexibility standpoint of implementing a front-end aspect on top of the platform. I just know that there's a lot of confusion, even though in the past, and it was talked about before, about you know, the, you, we use 10% of our brain, we use 10% of site core. It's very true. And I think that that's that confusion that happens on the business end versus on the actual development between front end and back end developers. Talking about that particular topic, one of the things that I came out really impressed was the ability to automate. Um, in nine, you're able to install uh, the entire instance through uh, a PowerShell um, scriptlet, and you are able to automate that so that in one of the uh, presentations, we saw how um, the partner was able to reduce their QA time 
by uh, modifying a little bit of uh, the install process and allow a QA person to actually deploy Sitecore with the branch, the feature branch that they wanted to test before it got merged into uh, either master or develop. That got tested, and if it didn't pass testing, it never got merged, so your uh, trunk was always stable. And the ability to do that with nine, and the ability to segregate your roles, that just makes automation a little easier, and it's probably uh, a little cheaper for people to, um, to be able to test. And uh, the affordability of Sitecore was one of the things that was in the back of my mind because it tends to be a little, a little uh, on the expensive side compared to other platforms that are doing headless, that are doing machine learning. But the ability to automate it is helping Ignore the music, just keep uh, development operations be able to manage that and provide a benefit for customers that is tangible. The music, it just threw everybody off. That's, <laughs> <laughs> Is that like the Oscars? Where they yeah, stop? yeah, yeah <laughs> but I didn't do it. So that's the and first the thing I looked at. The flashing, like the <laughs> over. I looked at Rick and it's like, it's not me, man. I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mark. Oh, the venue survey later. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we, that, the SIF tool and everything else, when we, when we talk about the ease of installation, obviously in, in DevOps improvements, we're talking about experience cloud as well and, and, and some of the things that that has after, not only from... Um, set up and installation, but throughout, you know, we're talking machine language, it all kind of centers around experience cloud. So what is the better compelling reason this year for people who are still on premise to, to join the cloud club? Well, one, one thing I saw was there's a Sitecore managed cloud now introduced. So, uh, you know, so it gives you a little bit easier installation. So it's for kind of like the newer person into Sitecore. This thing's already set up for them. You know, I'm sure there's some configuration and some PowerShell stuff, but at the same time, they can get up and going a lot faster now because Sitecore is integrated into the cloud, so. I do like the examples they were giving where, like, you can get it set up in no time at all in just 30 minutes. I'm like, that's not, like, no time at all, but, you know, it's better. It's significantly better, and I think, you know, it's not just the the traditional kind of CMS plus XDB that's going, um, you know, more cloud as well. You know, we're moving towards that in the commerce components as well. And I think the, the biggest push on it was that Sitecore was just really falling behind the rest of the competition. And it's what everybody wants from a, from a market perspective, not just from a development and DevOps perspective. And I think that just really drove it um, you know, with the change in leadership in Sitecore and all of that, a, a, you know, a nice, fresh push in a different direction. And they plan well. to monitor it too, as well yeah. as what what they said the hosting and monitoring. So in one of the presentations, so. And the change yeah. of licensing structures as well. So you know, there and I think that there were probably some points where it's like, oh, you know, they've thrown in SXA with Sitecore Commerce now. And it's like, hold on a minute. Actually, that's with the consumption-based licensing, not with the on-prem licensing. So I think. There are also some licensing attractions that come along with moving into, you know, the consumption and cloud licensing space for them as well. <laughs> the, the Gilligan's Island would be much fun. I'm losing it back here. Um, <clears throat> The bitch bewitch was big. It's like a bitch, lost crowd over there, and I really want to go and tell them to turn down their music. <laughs> well, no, the bewitch thing was great for the whole cloud conversation. <laughs> but Gilligan's Island, I just feel like we're stranded. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Next yeah. question. Next question. Speaking of, stranded, speaking of stranded. Speaking of stranded. Actually, speaking of stranded, if audience members have a question, just step up to the microphone. Um, there's a lot of good information here. But I will ask one more before we do that. X-Connect, we touched upon it. It is a complete different paradigm of how we're collecting information. We talked IoT a little bit, we talked different things. How far are we gonna take X-Connect, guys? When you install Sitecore 9 now, you are gonna have another um, web application running. And that is the ability of XDB to talk to the world whether you're coming to it from a watch, uh, another desktop site, a uh, presentation layer on top of your headless uh, implementation, or an IoT device. Uh, through JSON models, you can upload your data without having to be dependent on the 
web-centric way of feeding data into XDB that uh, you had before. Yeah, they basically made it sound like XConnect can consume anything. So whatever data you have at this point, it can go in there and be parsed and learned and, and translated and whatever transformations it does to it. So, um, you know, it, the, the whole, th the summary of the whole thing was it will be so much easier to get all your data into the site, into the, um, the processing database. And for the non-technical crowd, so if you have something like an AMS or some other type of third-party software to keep a member data, this now gives you a very easy way to get that data into site. Yep. And just as importantly, as into Sitecore for what you're doing with your content there, but out into another system from a true reporting perspective, I think that's the one I, I would say, while exciting as XConnect is for me, and I, I expressed this, so I'm glad that Sitecore is starting to listen more to us, but they took and have a tool and experience extractor today that they're not continuing, which is very marketer friendly, and they made everything back to, you know, and, and I don't mean this in a bad way, dependent on the developer, for using the APIs of XConnect to build everything for inbound and outbound. I had an easy outbound aspect through the experience extractor. I'm starting to lose that factor into nine. Um, something that you know Rick and I talked with the teams about at Sitecore because that is how we do things today without always having to have that API built. Now obviously the API is much more robust. It gives a lot of opportunity for different systems, but from an initial perspective of getting started, you don't have to wait for that full integration and API development to be done to actually use the data from within Sitecore. And at this point it's that requires you to have um, Solar or Azure uh, search. Uh, Lucene and um, providers are not there yet. And the next release, I hear. Yeah, I mean, we lost, we've lost a bit. Um, Mongo um, has kind of disappeared off the track for the first kind of release. You know, some reporting, Lucene, um, and you know, there's little bits here and there. Um, you know, I guess it's a trade-off of having you know complete kind of a re-architecture and some components, and you know, I guess X Connect is that. I mean, hopefully it'll be worth it in the long run and we'll be able to move past some of those pain points or move past the way we used to do things and kind of grow and evolve. Um, but I think, you know, the utilisation of XConnect still depends on the, you know, the digital maturity of the organisation as well. And unless you've got, you know, a way that you're actually going to use the data and you're paying attention to what you're collecting and what you want to put in there, you know, it's not really going to be much benefit to you yet. So I think there's still some really important pieces that need to come before you really start to have that kind of, um, yeah, there's, there's steps before thinking about, oh, I can get all this extra information in and I can push it into this other system and looking at the information you're collecting and why you're collecting it and what you ultimately want to be able to do with that too. Yeah, I think you, you touched on a good point there is there's now flexibility with Nine for your interaction database. That was exciting with the announcement is that you're not dependent on Mongo anymore. It could still be done, or you can go to Cosmos DB or SQL. No, no, Cosmos yet. Not yet. It's coming. <laughs> yeah, it's coming. Yeah. I didn't say which version of 9. <laughs> so, 9.9. .9. And, uh, <laughs> but you are getting more yeah. flexibility from that choice perspective overall, which before when they first released was 7.5, which you should never go into production with. Uh, I just have to state that. And, uh, you know, we were forced into Mongo was our only choice. I think that also threw a lot of people initially, so. Yeah, and it still does. Like, you still see it that MongoDB and getting an instance of MongoDB is still, like, this big hurdle for people mm -hmm. to get past, especially when, you know, they've picked a platform that's on the Microsoft stack. They're, you know, they're hosting it in Azure and stuff like that, and now they've got MongoDB, and you're like, uh, and you know sometimes it's like oh well we can host it in an external provider or we can um, you know roll it out ourselves or we can go with the cycle managed option which a lot of people seem to be picking and then there's some restrictions in that and yeah with great power comes great responsibility from uh, four databases that we had before <laughs> you have 12 at least now and then in install SQL commerce yeah. it's just it's interesting <laughs> Well, you know, my hope is, like, I, my, my last client, they had their uh, customer um, relationship management database, and they wanted to combine that with the, what's in MongoDB, so I had to create some data exchange framework stuff that took all that data, combined it, and then put it in SQL Server. So it sounds like with this new XConnect, 
that step would be gone. It would make me be in there, be combined. Um, Single so, customer view. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah, for them, I mean, they were they're were excited about it, but they're like, you know, why couldn't this come out a month ago? So, but and I think that's. You know, Overall, that's the key. It used to be single customer view was in your CRM. We're gathering all this information, yeah. putting the CRM for them to make, for marketers to make good decisions. And that's great, except you can't do any personalization with it. And it's all in an island. Suddenly now, if we bring it all into Sitecore, I can take all that CRM information and personalize my website for that. So your information that you can personalize with is so much greater once you do that versus keeping your CRM to me, that's a huge part of this. I There's mean, some really cool things that you could do with all that Exactly. Another thing Creepy I, things. I really Creepy. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, your single customer review, the, the foresight that they had in, in developing the architecture, that as you model the data for your contact, you can separate out the models so that if, if that model evolves over time, it's only affecting that one definition. So you could kind of have, you know, a wide set of models for the contact, and different systems can use different parts of that model, but it won't break the others. So I thought that was really neat to do that. So I want to talk a little bit about commerce because um, Kelly had mentioned commerce server as we knew it is buy, buy, buy. Like a whatever band song. You, no, don't, please don't play it. <clears throat> I think we've heard enough show tunes today. Um, so <laughs> let, let's talk about the uh, SXA storefront and what that's going to do for everyone. Right all at once. <laughs> I'm gonna, uh, I mean, yeah, it provides a good framework, but I think that there's a certain level where people are picking Sitecore Commerce and picking Sitecore in general, where it's not just about providing a simple storefront and a simple site for, you, you know, if you wanted that, you'd go with something, you'd have Shopify or something sort of similar. And I think part of it, and something that always comes up, is like, why we, why do we have all of these things? Why do we have a customer and order manager? Why do we have a catalog manager? You know, we've got an ERP and a CRM and, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Why do we need it? And I think that that's kind of the level that a lot of the inf implementations we end up doing are. And, you know, there were some presentations in the developer track on the same line that was, like, listed out. You know, this is what I generally have in a project. And you're like, w why do we need this other system? And I think it's, you know, the other system provides a consolidated way of accessing the information and storing the information for use on the front end side of your website. And then it all gets dispersed into, you know, your warehousing systems and your customer systems and all of that kind of jazz. So I think that part isn't really taken care of by the SXA storefront. Um, if you did, you know, have somebody that just wanted to spin up a really simple little site to maybe sell, like, I don't know, a brochure or something like that that was, you know, no additional information, no integration with other systems, then, yeah, you've got something in there. Um, it provides a good example and a good kind of starting point, I guess, maybe. Yeah, I did, I did a developer yeah. track with the XSA <laughs> commerce thing. It, it was cool because, you know, they, they made the storefront real quick, and but it was generic. I mean, it wasn't really something special, but if you're, if you're a small shop and you need something up quick, it's good, but, yeah. you know, it doesn't beat, like, a real good custom solution. It just, it's, but it is cost-effective for some, some a smaller... If company. you have consumption-based licensing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> true. After the licensing cost, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. otherwise SXA is quite an expensive tool yep. to use and there's a place for it. Um, I'm just not entirely sold that this place for it is actually, you know, Sitecore Commerce um, and that product because it's a crazy extensible product. Like, it's a little... There's this massive hurdle into like figuring out how to use it and how to extend the system, but you can extend it in like all these different ways, and it's just kind of this overwhelming pile of like JSON, really. <laughs> um, so you know, it's it's good in the way that it provides us with a new sort of flexibility that we didn't have before, and we don't have to worry about com and all, kind of all of that jazz and having connection strings in the registry and. You know, we can deploy it um, into Azure a bit better, but 
you know, we, we've still got a, there's a lot to learn still, um, even moving, you know, we had the plug-in architecture in the previous 8.2 releases for the um, orders and um, uh, pricing and promotion and that kind of things that was introduced before. And now we've got the rest of our subsystems are now kind of moved into the, the new architecture too. So there's, there's just a lot there. Um, it's a big, big product, but you know, the people in the commerce team are kind of, I feel, really driving a lot of the change that's happening within, you know, the architectural decisions within Sitecore. So it's kind of the guinea pig. <laughs> so how many people not up at the table here? I mean, all you guys. How many of you guys uh, were at uh, Symposium this year? Let's show hands. Okay, a few of you. For, for those that didn't go, and, and I know this is kind of like an uh, absorption of, of the people that went, um, from your day to day, what are you guys most looking for as far as improvements, as help? I mean, uh, the folks up here had mentioned that Sitecore is starting to listen. Things are happening. You're kind of hearing about a, a lot of different things in the product coming out. So what matters to you guys? Anyone? Sure, come up, come up to the uh, microphone. <laughs> <clears throat> or Rick will give you a microphone. It's like Donahue. Yeah, it's like yeah. Donahue. It's like Donahue. Donahue. <laughs> <laughs> it's even though we're talking about shows from the yeah, right. yeah. 70s, early 80s, it's like Donahue. I don't know what Donahue is. I was going to say three, four, in here. I don't know, remember that show? Yeah, I, I'm a document developer. Uh, I, uh, I want to learn site code in depth. What is the best way to learn? That's a good question. And um, I think everyone at our shop starts by going to, to the certification. Um, it's a good starter. It gets you able to come back after a week of um, kind of getting immersed in it, both the marketing side and the developer side, because they, they do talk on some of the personalization stuff. You can come back and start a project immediately knowing the terms and being able to talk and be part of stand-ups and you know um, we've had junior developers take that course and come back and are ready to hit the ground running you know there's always things that we're I'm still learning I've been doing it for a while now we always learn stuff but um, that's a good place to start um, there's a ton of stuff on the internet I mean it's just widely supported there's stack overflow groups there's um, there's tons of blogs on it but I mean I think it's just uh, I recommend starting with that certification and then coming back and um, immersing yourself in the community. There are a few books out there to get you started. There was one really old one, but there was a recent one that was just released too as well. So. I think community as well. Like it's such a, you know, a, a community that's willing to help people learn as well. And I think that it's, it is a difficult platform to get into, but there are a lot of resources, but it's a good community of a bunch of good people. And I guess, you know, Turning up here is probably one of the a good first step as well. Yeah, you, you should try to join the. Uh, there's a Slack group for Sitecore. It's excellent. I mean, any question you have, yep. it can be answered there. There's also the Sitecore Stack Exchange, and Twitter as well is really popular. So, and there are some Facebook groups. There's a Reddit group. So, the the community keeps growing, and it, it it's going to continue to grow exponentially. I mean, we're we're seeing it. Um, I've been an MVP for four years, and I've seen it just drastically change in those four years. So um, the best bet, every, you know, the, the thing that I would emphasize are the blogs. Um, find, uh, find some Sitecore MVPs and follow them and, and see what they're writing about. And you know, it's, it's trial and error too. And that's really hard to do with Sitecore. It's not exactly the, the easy cost of entry. Really easy to error. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, it's a matter of, if, if you have a license and you have the, the tools, you can get into it. And I think that's the hardest cost of entry, right, is, is actually getting your hands on it. Yeah. So yeah. Sitecore has also stepped up their own documentation finally the past. Yeah. I just, with eight, they kind of started it, but they even uh, you know started talking about maybe some more improvements coming to their online documentation. So I think again, it's vanilla, it's basic, but it gets that terminology that you were talking about kind of just into your mind, and you can keep looking at it. The biggest thing about their documentation site is make sure you look at the right version of Sitecore that you're on, yeah. because there are differences in certain areas. Uh, so make sure that you set that right away. 
And I believe the certification is moving into e-learning. Um, so there's a, right. a, yeah. a smaller, because the four-day training course is a huge cost to try and get your, um, That's true. It your is work expensive. or yourself to kind of consider. So once they start releasing that, the e-learning and certification should be um, a lot cheaper. So yeah. it will there's be an easier sell. There's a free one right now that you can do e-learning wise. Um, that's a good kind of developer foundation. And uh, as a non-developer in today's time, I was able to go through it without having to have a lot of difficulty as far as what they were asking you to do and some of the quizzes and everything. But it gave that, again, that terminology throughout of how things are structured, data sourced items. I mean, it's just, it's ways that were uh, good to know, even though I'm not developing in Sitecore for the non-developers in the room. The, there's gonna be a, a, a uh, Sitecore 9 course. The MVPs had first crack at it to kind of you know, kick the tires, make sure any bugs were in it, anything like that. And we had an opportunity to get certified right away during symposium. So um, I'm, I'm afraid to ask, because I might be the only one to raise my hand. Is anybody, okay, you're certified? Cool, I'm gonna raise my hand too. <laughs> Right. Certified uh, in nine, nine or just in nine? Nine. 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 Certifiable? Nope. <laughs> Certifiable is something different, right? But thank, thanks. Also, the Sidecore documentation portal, uh, they, they have now developer uh, section of it, so it's not mixed with the marketing and the authoring mm -hmm. part of the documentation. So you, you can go to the documentation portal for Sidecore, and there is a developer section only. Uh, so you can start there. I, I would say Sidecore documentation. Um, one of the awesome, thing, awesome things that you can do, and you've already done it, is go to groups like this, like the Chicago and the Milwaukee group and, and any other regional groups if you have the chance. Um, <clears throat> community is very open. People love to talk about Sitecore. Ask questions away. Pick their brains. Chad, do you want to ask a question? No. Just... <laughs> <laughs> We're laughing at you. <laughs> Anyone else? Actually, I do have a question. Okay. Um, I'll speak in the mic. Did they discuss any um, path forward type of scenarios to get onto .NET Core in the future? Um, as well, follow up, second question, I guess. Did they talk about anything um, with regards to like uh, using Sitecore for uh, other platforms such as uh, like mobile applications or other things that are non-website? directly website related. The .NET Core is happening already. Yeah. So there's the publishing service, there's the commerce stuff, and I think X Connect is .NET Core? No, it's just OData. Okay. Well, yeah, so they're starting and I believe there's a plan. Um, I don't know how much of that's like the allowed to share kind of stuff, but I think everybody knows it's happening. It's definitely there with publishing engine. It's definitely there with cycle commerce which the commerce engine is completely .NET Core um, 2.0 in 9, so, yeah. And to the second part of your question, the headless portion of Sitecore allows you to do that. Uh, there are a few frameworks already created in different languages. Uh, more are coming, and you can pick and choose which one you want to implement your um, own presentation. At the end of the symposium, there was a an appetizing a uh, piece of information regarding what will happen in the future. And one of the cool things was that you could even serve your pages as Azure functions and have them scale that way. Not only that, but you could um, have them editable through some instrumentation they have or they will have uh, with Experience Editor, even if it's just a JavaScript page. I'm not a developer, straight up. <laughs> Shout out to my Aussie friend right here. Good on you, Kelly. I, like, right job. Right on. <laughs> um, I suppose a couple of questions. What are the ramifications because um, Sitecore have sort of made their bed with Azure now, or Azure or whatever you guys call it over here? <laughs> um, Talk about what, <laughs> what, are, what, what are the ramifications if you're with an AWS and you're sort of committed to them? And then second part of the question is, because they're, they're developing so heavily into this experience cloud and, and experience manager inside of things, what's going to happen to businesses that are running legacy systems like a Marketo or a customer data platform? Is that, is that going to have ramifications the more developed that Sitecore 9 gets? Or 
do you think that businesses like that will sort of be safe on those sort of uh, you know legacy systems that they've already got? I think they'll be safe. I think because of the fact that they're developing nine to be integratable to any external data source that um, you know that kind of stuff, you'll still be able to do that. And as far as you know, being on AWS versus Azure or Azure, nobody can decide how to say that. <laughs> I believe it's Azure, but. Um, you know, they're making it easy for you because they have this toolkit to, to push to the cloud and all this, this stuff, but that there's nothing stopping you from hosting it on AWS or, you know, your own personal, you know, yeah. Raspberry Pi or whatever the hell you have sitting <laughs> at your house. You can do it, you can host it on anything you want. The Azure integration is just kind of making it easier and that's the partner that they're, they're working with. But ramifications, you just don't get any of this, the cool, sexy kind of integration with it. But the one, one thing I will add to that, like Sitecore does not openly support Amazon RDS. So there are ramifications if you do go on something they don't openly support. So that's the only thing to kind of keep in mind. Yeah. Yeah. And the guys at work, I work for Milwaukee Tool, and the guys at work had a look at Azure and they said that there were some security issues they were concerned about. I mean, it's a, I'm like, really? Security guys always have security issues. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> they're never, they're never going to get over that. Yeah. Yeah. For, for the Marketo side, though, I think that there's still a play for Marketo, Pardot, in certain circumstances where Sitecore, while it is one of the more mature platforms that has a lot baked into it, those tools have a completely different level, especially from an email marketing perspective. And the EXM tool, the email experience manager tool, Sitecore, is still not at that level. Um, while they are making strides to improve upon it, I think that's where those systems still live. As far as the marketing automation and the capabilities, though, of more of the workflow that happens in the marketing automation mindset, that's where Nine is exciting. They're continuing to invest and grow into it. But I also, you know, it's one of those things that I think smartly, Sitecore has not tried to bite off more than they can chew of saying, we're gonna be a replacement for those tools yet because so many companies are so invested into them that they're just not gonna switch over to one unless it's at the exact same level or it's actually surpassing the level of the platform they're in. Okay, I uh, want to wrap up um, on what we are, are uh, for the panel. So next year's symposium is going to be in Orlando. So for each one of you guys, what can we expect? What are the predictions for next year, seeing what we saw this year and, and, and the trends? Tim's left. More kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't Vegas, man, that's for yeah. sure. No. Um, I, I would say that we're going to see uh, a little bit more insight into the tools that were mentioned about the promise of the, uh, I'm trying to remember the names right now, Horizon and Cortex. Cor uh, no, Cortex is the, uh, the, the, oh, the uh, Zenith. Yeah. Zenith, yeah. the TV. How could I forget? Yeah. Um, <laughs> since we're talking really like 60s, yeah. so. <laughs> Um, I think we're going to see more surrounding that because at, even with the announcement uh, that they gave, which again very appetizing, but you know that 80% uh, you know reality, 20% dream. I think those numbers were a little miskewed, if not flipped, uh, for what they were demoing. But it's out there now, so I think it's also a promise that they're investing heavily towards that type of interface to be more competitive. So I think that we're going to see that really come to fruition more in next year's symposium than we would in any iterations before that. Yep. Um, I, I guess I expect to see a lot of that become more mature uh, as well, some of the things that they talked about. Cortex right now is literally, for most of us that weren't in the developer track, it's kind of this, you know, this black box of machine learning buzzword, you know, and you're all excited and you wake up, you walk out of here and go, the hell am I excited about? It's you know I don't really know what I just saw. Um, Vicky bought a bunch of stereo equipment and I'm happy for her. You know, so it's it's. Uh, I think some of this will get more mature. Machine learning's here. Um, it's still kind of a buzzword, but I think Sitecore has really taken the um, the initiative to to make this stuff part of their platform. Uh, some of the small things like the dynamic placeholders this year. They're also um, they, nobody mentioned this, but they're restructuring the config setup. So that when you, uh, there's no more naming your stuff ZZZ underscore my dot config, you know, you can put it in a segmented folder and it'll load it after all the site core junk gets loaded. So um, I think those kind of things, they'll, they'll keep listening to the community and they'll keep in, integrating those, you know, those um, small iterative things that we've all been asking for 
Um, Web Forms for Marketers is going away, like they said. Uh, well, it's, it'll still be available, but they'll have this uh, their built-in thing that's just right right out of the box. It's in the platform. That'll probably get better. So for me, I'm just kind of seeing some of these ideas that are pretty infant right now really solidify into something cool that we can actually start using instead of just going. That'll be cool when it when it matures. So no more speak either. No more speak. Oh yeah, uh, Angular. Yeah. That was yeah, it'll still be speak. Angular too. So. They'll still be speak, but just not speak as we know, which is speak much better. Yeah. Not as aggravating, I guess, right? <laughs> they talked a lot about Helix, too, by the way. Um, yes. yeah. That's something yeah. that I think uh, for us, we need to just kind of start adopting some of those principles. But mm -hmm. it's really, I think, um, from what I've learned, it's a big ch If you're not already doing it, it's a big change because now you have a million projects instead of one single big project. And um, uh, it would take us a long time to restructure our code base to do that. But Helix principles and best practices and stuff, we're always trying to follow those. And I think um, they are really they really express that a lot in all the things that I was a part of. So Yeah, it sounds like even for support, having a Helix set project set up is going to make it so much easier because that's, that's what they want you to do yeah. is have your project set up. I know it's hard to convert existing ones, but yep. there's, a, there's, a, there's a little bit of a learning curve with it, so... Mine's not really an expecting, I guess, but what I'm hoping for um, out of next year. And I think one of my bi biggest disappointments um, in Vegas was really, I think, the lack of like female um, kind of participation and presenters there. I think I got really angry one night and added it all, <laughs> all up. Um, and it was around 17% of the presenters at the um, symposium were female. It was a little disappointing. So I think, you know, I'd like to see next year and you know, going forward, Sitecore really kind of trying to involve more women and actively going out and do something about it rather than being like, oh, well, we just don't have enough women coming or we don't have enough women interested, like, why not? <laughs> um, and looking at trying to, um, you know, solve some of the um, gender disparity issues that we do kind of see in the industry as well. So There were a lot of women in the audience that you have to expect that there's a lot of intelligent women there that yeah. could have been up and been one of those speakers. So I don't think it's a lack of availability. I just don't know if maybe it's not pushed or not supported or yeah. we have a, a male-dominated field for the most part. It's, it's nice to see how many women, intelligent women, were there being a part of that. So I think some of them could step up and and be very good presenters. Yeah, and I don't know if it's that they didn't step up. Um, like, you know, there was one board member executive of Sitecore who wasn't in any of the Sitecore kind of keynote yeah. things, and instead we had a chief revenue officer, Yeah. Um, which was an interesting title to put in front of people. Um, so I, I just, yeah, it would be nice to kind of see a little bit more um, on the main stage and, you know, presenting as well. There's a lot of viewpoints that are missed when, when we don't do um, full inclusion like that. I mean, whether it was on purpose or just oversight or yeah. whatever, it, it, it's there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and I'm not saying it's on purpose. Oh, I no, just, no. It's you know, um, I think we, we are at a, that kind of level and we're in a male dominated industry and yeah. it's maybe just, you know, you have to take extra steps to fix it. You can't think it's just going to resolve itself and we'll somehow end up at like 50 50 because history has shown us we won't. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're, we're losing out quite a bit not getting um, the different perspectives of voice, for sure. So, I wholeheartedly agree. We work with a few other uh, platforms, um, and one thing I have started to see is the move towards the uh, conversational web, where you can talk to Alexa, Cortana, or, or Google. What I would like to see is a maturity of the support for that type of platforms, uh, whether they call them IoT or, or something else, and uh, see examples of that working with, with Sitecore. Someone may know something about that. Um, you know, one more thing I'd like to add, too, is that um, for our shop, we really push hard on being Sitecore best practices and doing things the right way and you know component first and experience editor first um, and aside from all the whiz bang newfangled stuff that they put out there there were a couple of courses that um, were just basically getting started which I was like is a getting started course good for a senior dev who's been doing this for a while but actually I learned a lot of stuff from some of those sessions Jeffrey Rondo was one that stuck out immediately followed him on Twitter afterwards. He had really nice ways to say, like, here's the experience editor you've been using. 
we're going to sexy it up and make it really nice for your your content ad, admins and stuff. And we we like that. We're very much, especially a, a rule on my team is that we have to make sure that our clients um, who are using this and entering data are uh, are comfortable with it because they came from a system where they basically put their data in UAT, made a content package, and pushed that to production. And it was scary and not cms -y at all. So, like, the experience editor is something I really wanted to, to gift to this client when we put them on Sitecore. We're on 8. So, um, unfortunately, we're not on 8.2 yet. But just those, those kind of classes that taught us how to, you know, extend some of the stuff that I didn't even know was possible. It's that past that 10% that we're already using. Um, so those courses and those um, things that they that they put put out there, I found really interesting. Aside from what's new in nine, it was like, here's how to make your current implementation better because we're still on eight and we're still doing stuff that isn't nine yet. So um, I hope they keep doing that. And uh, if you go to the symposium, I recommend not being scared by the fact that it may sound like an intro course because I learned some stuff. So. Yeah, and I, I had the same experience. There was a course, A Day in the Life of a Developer. They talked about using virtual machines. So you're not you're not just doing your instance, everyone does their own, but you're up and running like within an hour of the site. So, so you had to just get the copy of the virtual machine. Um, they talked about stuff like testing sites with different region settings to see how it looks in a variety of browsers. Yeah. You know, how many people really, you know, I don't, we, we do that, but it's like, it's not always common for everybody to do that, you know. We try to do it, but you know, you're getting that site out. That's one of the steps. Um, so there, there was stuff like that, that just valuable information that you know you, you get used to doing the same thing every day, but never thinking outside the box and just picking people's other developer brains just yeah. helped a lot. It was amazing. Yeah. I, oh, I like the uh, attention to the getting started, but. More the business marketing side, this year's symposium, even compared to last year's in New Orleans, I think the number of non-developers was exciting to me, that we actually had content authors, marketers, who are using the system day in, day out, have a little bit larger of a presence there than just the development crowd. And I think that was exciting to see that it's now kind of branching out. Mark, you said the community is exponentially growing. I think it's growing on both sides, both from the development as well as the marketer, content author side. So that was exciting for me. And that getting started track was one that, like you said, don't be afraid of going back kind of just to that basics of, there might be something that I've forgotten about even how to utilize because I don't have to use it every day that's been there and it's still very useful for you. Also, did you go to the symposium along the lines of what you guys were saying, don't be afraid to cross tracks. Yes. Don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. I was really inspired to see Well, it's cool because those those people on that side ask questions that were like, that give us developers, you know, like, wow, that is a need of yours that I didn't know that you had, you know. And we talk to our own content people, but networking with people outside of our um, our teams and our companies and organizations is like, wow, that's cool. So that's something that you really need that you're not provided, and you know, I can bring that back to my team, and they probably have the same need or similar need. So yeah, that was cool. Cross track. I like the idea of the genius bar. That uh, oh, that was a hit. There were lines lined up to talk to engineers. Uh, you just made an appointment and you talked to them. That was pretty cool. Yeah, I want that to continue. I think it's cool to just meet people as well. And like, there's people from all over the world there. So, you know, there's different markets and different concerns. And you know, sometimes when you're in, you know, like one area of focus, you forget that like, you know, I started doing cycle work in Australia and things like that. And it's a completely different market um, to what it is in the US. And, you know, the same goes for Europe and the different regulations there. So I think that because we're turning into more of a global economy anyway, you're going to start having clients in Australia and Asia and Europe. And, um, you know, meeting people who work in those regions can kind of bring on some new ideas as well and some new concerns that you didn't even think about, like what Thai text looks like on a website. It looks weird. Like, <laughs> so. And again, all, all I do is agree with what you say. Uh, I think one of the best things I got out of it was the ability to meet people. And sometimes we all get caught in our circles, but suddenly I'm talking to people from companies I'd never heard of, places I'd never heard of, 
and having those conversations and finding out what they need and what their desires are. And so I think that, to me, was one of the, the best part of that is, you know, not just the tracks, but just the meeting of people, talking to people on the floor, talking to people at the parties, getting, getting to know people. And now suddenly I'm following these people on Twitter or conversing, you know, conversing with them, and I'm learning a lot just from that. So it's not only what I learned there, but the connections I made, which give me a chance to learn a whole lot more, that learning can continue all year long. And don't forget Mark Hamill, Luke Skywalker yeah. was there too. So <laughs> that, was, uh, really cool. that was really cool. I think, I think uh, Geek Hive had probably the coolest swag table there. Um, oh, yeah. You could go up yeah. and uh, put an order in and uh, get a t-shirt screen printed right there, which was really cool. However, I think they missed out because I saw somebody there with, an, with a t-shirt that said admin slash B. And I thought, that is the coolest freaking Psychor t-shirt I've ever seen. I'm like, that should have been one of the designs. And if you yeah. can bring that back, I'd pay money for that shirt. Just yeah. Yeah. Actually, I, I, when you watch this video, did you hear that? Yeah. That's, uh, that's uh, one of the MVPs yeah. uh, makes those shirts. Yeah, that is, it's so cool. I saw one or two people with it, and I was like, that is, uh, nobody else gets that but us Psychor nerds, but it, it's, uh, it was really cool. But Geek Hive, you know, that was nice. Um, nice to be able to go in and get a T-shirt to kind of, um, memorialize the, the whole weekend and stuff. Is it going to be third year running next year? Or? Uh, it depends on the licensing cost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The lines are so long, I didn't even... Yeah, the lines yeah. Were, were bad, but that's a sign of a good product, yeah. right? So. You need a Starbucks in that line. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no kidding. So... Um, I think we're we're kind of at time. Um, feel free and, and grab a piece of pie from next door, apparently. Um, but uh, uh, as we clean up, feel free to, to mingle and, and talk with, with uh, fellow attendees here. And I thank you all for coming. I thank the panel for coming up here and, and sharing. I appreciate it. Um, uh, thank you, Chicago. Um, this, this joint meetup is terrific. We should do this like... Let's do this every week. <laughs> yeah, here, here, now. Can you tell my wife she's going to take the kids once a week then? I have no, I'm not getting involved with that at all. Me neither. Good, good, good choice. All right, thank you very much, guys. Thank you for coming out.